Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Razan Pereira. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Thursday said enhancing all kinds of connectivity, including in social, digital and financial spheres with the 10-nation ASEAN grouping is a major priority for India. He made the remarks at a virtual summit between India and the ASEAN. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN is considered one of the most influential groupings in the region and India and several other countries including the US, China, Japan and Australia are its dialogue partners. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the India-ASEAN Summit. Joining me on the programme today are Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former ambassador, Sriram Chaulia, foreign affairs expert and Pramit Pal Chaudhary, Foreign Editor, Hindustan Times. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Uh, you know, Sriram, let me bring you into the picture now. You know, as far as the points raised by Pramit Pal Chaudhary, two aspects. One, of course, uh, is ASEAN, the you know, still as important as it used to be, say, a few years ago? Secondly, going forward, should India then focus on bilateral relations with, you know, some of the ASEAN countries rather than focus on the grouping as a whole? Well, Frank, I think uh, when we say ASEAN centrality, um, obviously we would like it to be a coherent group because see, China uh, is at an advantage when there is no broad-based regional cooperation. If there is a broad-based regional formation like uh, 10 countries, ASEAN, all acting in concert, cohesive as we say, we want cohesive and a central uh, ASEAN for the whole Indo-Pacific, uh, I think that is to China's disadvantage, right? So. And ASEAN, they have their own internal, you know, uh, mechanisms and dialogue processes for unification of the bloc, you know, and for ushering. For initially, it was only an economic integration, and they have achieved a lot through that, through free trade uh, area. But uh, now the question is, uh, politically, uh, the Chinese have, you know, played one off against the other. So um, the we should, I think, continue to aspire for ASEAN's unity. And and centrality, which we keep on restating, and which was done at the summit as well, India ASEAN summit. But then the question is, um, I think what is missing is uh, the connectivity that can actually glue them together, uh, because the Chinese uh, have been uh, partial to some countries, and uh, especially Laos, Cambodia. You know, you can say they're almost in China's pocket. And on the other hand, the countries that resist Chinese hegemony. Um, are are uh, kept out. Uh, although they, China also has trade with Vietnam and the Philippines, so um, I think what has been missing is the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. This that structure, they've pretty much encompassed almost all of ASEAN under it, uh, in some form or the other. So what has been missing is an alternative, and there Japan has been trying to put up an alternative. Um, and the Japanese, you know, they have we along with Japan have a couple of initiatives. One is the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, which traverses the ASEAN region. The second is, you know, recently Australia, Japan, India, we announced the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, SCRI. And that was to diversify our supply risk instead of, you know, being dependent on just one country, which is China. Uh, this is the realization that uh, many ASEAN countries also face in the wake of the coronavirus uh, crisis and all that. Um, and Vietnam has been been able to uh, attract a lot of uh, investment fleeing China due to the U.S.-China trade war. Uh, mm -hmm. So Vietnam manufacturing, Vietnam export has increased, in including to India. Some of it is Chinese uh, goods rerouted through ASEAN members, about which we are worried. And that's why ambassadors talking about the rules of origin. So um, the other is the, you know, the Japanese have the partnership for qua uh, uh, quality infrastructure. Uh, and we have our prime ministers propose the uh, coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. Now, ASEAN countries, the poorer ones, do are not very strong in infrastructure, and they are right. becoming more and more related to China. So this is where I think if we can put together uh, coherent alternatives for connectivity and uh, supply chain and for uh, economic well-being, I think that will be because whenever I've been to uh, you know a number of these countries, I've worked in the Philippines, in Vietnam, they're often very uh, cautious about upsetting China. In spite of the geopolitical rivalry and the you know uh, the threats China poses to their uh, claims over uh, the South China Sea region, and the reason is they say that you know it's China is our largest trading partner, it's our largest sure. investor. Uh, they, the U.S. is kind of missing in action. If Jap so, therefore, I think 
India, Japan, Australia, and if the US comes on board under a Biden administration, which will have a more multilateral focus, uh, well and good. If the Quad can really energize this. And ASEAN has now come up with this Indo-Pacific outlook, Frank. Mm, what mm, they earlier, mm. what it essentially means is same thing which we all say: rules-based order, um, inclusive, no dialogue, uh, no bullying, and most importantly, no uh, distinction between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Now they're so, all one and Indo-Pacific, which is an advantage for us. It's an invitation for us to enter and play a bigger role. So I think we have to capitalize on that and continue to insist on ASEAN centrality. Although we are quite uh, pragmatic enough to realize that you know some of these cannot be priced away from China's orbit, but those which are willing to, we should uh, you know we should uh, forge ahead with meaningful cooperation with economics as the base because the ASEAN countries often say we don't want hard balancing against China. We don't want to become part of a military coalition or an alliance. What right. we want is a kind of a softer balancing. So there, I think infrastructure, economy, technology, 5G, these kind of things, if we can get our act together jointly, it will. they will really appreciate it and come on board. Okay. All right. Points taken. You know, Sriram Chalia, so what should India's strategy be going forward? Well, Frank, uh, you know, Prime Minister mentioned at the summit that, you know, speeding up connectivity is our top priority. And unfortunately, our record in promising and delivering connectivity projects has not been great. Dr. Jai Shankar is really persevering and trying to push very hard to complete. I mean, the for example, the India Myanmar Thailand uh, highway, trilateral highway, has been delayed uh, for more than a decade now. And uh, you know, there are many reasons for it. Um, some of it have are beyond our control. Some of it just have to do with contractual, you know, failures and you know, builders uh, not delivering what they were supposed to, you know, uh, bureaucratic processes. So that is where, you know, the Chinese have stolen a march ahead of us. And they are far faster in doing all kinds of railways, highways, bridges, you know, multimodal transport networks under BRI, but also in other bilateral formats. That's the thing where, you know, we have to learn a lot from them. Even the Kaladan Transport Corridor, for example, um, this again with um, uh, northeastern India and Myanmar. For northeastern India, it will be a huge developmental gateway if these things uh, get going. And then, you know, further afield, I think uh, one of the, uh, uh, as Ambassador was mentioning, we are seen to be uh, protectionist and not part of the broader regional integration that's happening, especially RCEP. And uh, we will need to find new means to integrate ourselves uh, and to uh, for our market to be accessible to. Uh, ASEAN countries. Already we have, of course, uh, India ASEAN FTA, almost $90 billion of bilateral trade is going on. And uh, I think India has a relatively small deficit of to about $25 to $28 billion in that. Um, so, but uh, I think once we get the rules of origin in place, we can make sure that ASEAN is not becoming a backdoor for China to flood us. And once we have those assurances, either we go back into RCEP or we rejoin some kind of expanded uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm sure uh, Biden administration will try to revive it in some form or the other. Japan has been leading regional integration processes parallel to China because right. Japan cannot accept Chinese hegemony ever. So I think we have to you know, hang out a lot more with the Japanese. The Incidentally, while uh, our prime minister was uh, launching the ASEAN-India summit, on the same day, they had parallelly the China-ASEAN and also the Japan-ASEAN. The mm -hmm. ASEAN has mm -hmm. this ASEAN plus one format, uh, and China and Japan are also there. And if you see what is going on in those summits, Frank, I mean, the Japanese are promising uh, a lot more investment, especially for epidemic control and for you know, public health in ASEAN, for right. you know, disaster relief. The Japanese are, have already become more uh, proactive in supplying uh, weaponry to uh, Vietnam. And we have now given for the first time ever a submarine to Myanmar. So if you add up all those, and the Australians are very strong with Indonesia and with sure. the Pacific Island nations, which are adjoining ASEAN. So if you add up all that, there is a lot of work to be done. But if, if now we are prioritizing it much more under ACTI. So I'm hopeful that the quicker we implement these, I mm. think the, you know, the express, the train will start moving. Sriram Chalia, close the show for us with a quick concluding remark. Yeah, Frank, I think Narendra Modi government has tried to create the sense and uh, the consciousness in India that ASEAN is actually our neighbor, our maritime neighbor. How far is Andaman Island from the nearest to Southeast Asian country, Indonesia? Very close. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, this is part of our maritime uh, consciousness that is arising, the Indo-Pacific outlook that has emerged. 
and uh, closer ties are inevitable uh, because of the geopolitical pressure of china but also because we are realizing that we have as we grow our initially we said our neighborhood was only south asia but now the whole of southeast asia and beyond is also our neighborhood as is west asia so our ambit is expanding and accordingly we have to also spend more resources we have to also give more diplomatic energy we have to push our private uh, companies and private sector uh, to invest more and to go out more in this region that sure. is the way we will be able to ultimately realize our goal of asean centrality and a balanced indo pacific absolutely all right on that note then i'll call it to wrap on this edition of the big picture thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us